This morning, I'd like to um, read from Romans chapter 8. I believe um, I, I selected the first 14 verses. And uh, one thing I should mention about this particular section is that it's not the easiest part of the Bible to understand. It is a little bit uh, complicated if you, you're not familiar with this language. But let me just simply say that Paul is, is telling the church at Rome, he wrote this to them actually, to explain the gospel more fully to them, that if you trust in Jesus Christ, you are not condemned. Your sins cannot condemn you. He goes on to talk about how we might know that we've trusted Jesus Christ, and that is the power of sin is broken in our lives. He gives us the ability not to sin, as it were. Uh, it's not a perfect ability. Sadly, Christians still sin. We still have to wrestle with that our entire lives. But He puts within our hearts a desire to do what is good. He gives us a love for what is right, though we come into the world with a love for what is wrong. And that's the reason why we have all the problems that we have in the world, at least the problems that are centered in, in mankind. Uh, why we have war, why we have people killing one another, why we have lying and cheating and all these different things that are going on, why people hate one another. It's because of sin. And that's something that uh, came about because of the first man. And we'll look at that in the, uh, the sermon. But again, as we read through this, we'll see that Paul is describing this struggle. He tells us what Jesus has done to overcome it. But also, with regard to the resurrection, he tells us that if God gives us His Spirit to overcome this hatred in our heart and to give us love, that will also tell us that even as that Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, raised Jesus Christ from the dead on the third day, so He will do the same for us if we have trusted Him. So with that in mind, let me read this, uh, this text. Hopefully, it will make better sense. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Him." If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. So again, we have really described for us the two kinds of people that live in this world, those who are according to the flesh, those who are according to the Spirit. What's the difference between them? Those who are according to the Spirit have the Spirit of God dwelling in them, they are the ones trusting Jesus Christ. They are the ones who are putting to death the hateful deeds, sins uh, that, that they committed before when they didn't have the Spirit of God. Uh, they are the ones who are doing what the Lord calls them to do, and that shows that they really do belong to Him. 
But again, the point I wanted to draw out here is this, is, is that if you're trusting Jesus, if the Spirit of God is living in you, you are living this way, and it also means that when you die, your body will be raised up again even as Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, I think that's a very important thing because this morning I really do want us to think about the one thing that I know because uh, I'm a human being myself, the one thing I know that we all fear more than anything else in this world, and that is death. This text tells us how we can overcome it. Now, life, as you know, is the one thing that if you lose, it's something that, at least as far as we know, we cannot get it back again. I mean, once you're dead, you're dead. You don't see people being raised from the dead and those people who seemingly do. I would suggest we're not really fully dead to begin with. When you go to the cemetery, and I'm sure that all of you have been to a cemetery at one time or another because you want to go and you want to remember those people that you cared about, those people whom you, you love, to remember them, uh, you've noticed that the number of people never decreases in the cemetery, does it? It's always either the, you know, either the same or more. It's increasing. People don't leave the cemetery because death is one way. At least that's the way it appears at present, and I'm going to speak about that a little bit more in a moment. But what if it didn't have to be that way? What if death wasn't one way? What if there was someone who could save you from death? Is that something you would like to know about? Well, you know, the Bible tells us that there is such a person, and His name is Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God who became a man in order to live and to die so that if you would simply trust Him, in a very real sense, you would not have to die. Jesus said on one occasion to comfort uh, one who was very near to him, his, uh, her name was Martha, whose brother had passed away and his body had been laid in a tomb. To comfort her, he said this, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then he asked Martha, do you believe this? And she says, yes, I believe that you are the Christ, the one who comes into the world. If that's your trust, if that's your hope, the Bible says you will live even if you die, and in a certain sense, you will never die. Now, how can you know that Jesus is actually able to save you from death? Well, the way that you can know this is because after He was crucified, after He was buried, He rose again on the third day, never to die again because He had overcome death. Jesus says that He is able to do the same thing for you if you will simply trust Him. Now, that's what I want us to consider this morning, and I want us to do it briefly by looking at three things. First of all, how it is you and I got into the situation that we're in, that we're faced with death. Secondly, what God did to fix the problem. And then thirdly, how you can receive what it is that God did through Jesus Christ. So first of all, let's consider how you got into this situation to begin with. You know, it's interesting that um, maybe you've, you've noticed that after you reach a, a certain age, that um, you begin to go a different direction than you were originally going. I mean, from the time that you're born up until about age 30, you know, you seem to be getting stronger, you seem to be looking better, you know, and things are getting better all the time, but once you reach age 30, you begin to go the other direction. You begin to decline. Things don't begin to look as good as they used to. You begin to get wrinkles and gray hair, and uh, you know, your, your body begins to change in various ways. Well, that's because the cells in your body are no longer able to replicate, duplicate themselves the way, you know, the way they used to. The cells only have a certain shelf life, you might say. They only live for so long, and then they need to reproduce themselves uh, and make a replacement. Uh, so that you can go on living. Well, after age 30, your cells aren't able to replicate as well as they did before. They begin losing some of the information 
uh, that was on the DNA molecule. By the way, that DNA molecule is perhaps one of the strongest arguments for the fact that God created us because there is no way to explain all the information that is on that molecule. There's enough to fill hundreds of textbooks with complicated chemical equations and information, the blueprints to build a human being. There's, there's a context and a mechanism that, that actually is able to use it, and there's even directions encoded on the DNA molecule that, that tell everything how to work, how to use the information that's there. It's really an amazing thing. But as these cells replicate, that information is lost. And the loss of that information eventually causes your death. Now, scientists understand something of this process. They understand something of why this happens. There, there's really a part of the DNA that is lost every time the cell replicates. I think a good illustration of it, uh, somebody put it on, on one particular web page, is think of it as, say, like a paper that you wrote. And your paper has nice margins, and you put it into a copy machine, and you make copies, and then you take the copy out, and you make a copy of that, and you keep doing that. As you do that, you'll notice that your copy begins to move, and the margins change because the copy machine isn't able to make a perfect copy. And eventually, it begins to eat into your text. So after a while, you won't even be able to see the text. You're losing information. Well, early on, when the cell is replicating, it's just losing the, the margins, as it were. It's not losing any valuable information. But eventually, through this replication process, the margin disappears, and you do begin losing important information that eventually kills the cell or makes it impossible for it to replace itself. Now, it's also interesting that scientists have discovered an enzyme that the cell produces that is able to replace those missing parts and allow the cell to continue to survive and divide uh, over time. But you see, what happens is our cells eventually stop making that enzyme, so we lose that margin and we begin losing information. By the way, I think it's interesting that scientists are aware of the fact that this enzyme is there, but why don't they find a way to get the cell to turn that enzyme on so that we can just keep on living. Well, the problem is, interestingly enough, that this enzyme actually, um, in, let's put it this way, when, when your body develops cancer, which is a very dangerous thing, cancer begins to grow uncontrollably. One of the reasons why it does is because cancer, the, the, when the cell becomes affected by cancer, it turns on that enzyme. And it makes the cell virtually immortal and it just keeps on multiplying and multiplying and there's no way to stop it because that enzyme is actually turned back on. In other words, what eventually kills us, the fact that that enzyme stops being produced, is something that may actually keep us from becoming riddled with tumors and dying prematurely in another way. But this is what I want you to see. The ingredients for immortality seem to be present in our bodies. It's there. But for some reason, it's not working together in the way that it should. Now, why doesn't it work? Well, scientists really don't know. They know what's causing us to grow old and die. They, they know what they might be able to do to stop it, but realize cancer stands in their way. But why is it that it's not working together the way it should? I mean, it's all there. It works at a certain period of time for at least the first 30 years and then we begin losing it. Well, scientists can't explain it because they're looking in the wrong place. What they can't explain, God actually tells us in His words. These things are working the way that they work now because of something the Bible calls sin. We are all going to die because of sin. Sin is actually a choice to disobey God. It is rebellion. It is, in essence, hatred. It offends God and it offends other people. Now, we will die because of a choice that a man made many years ago. It's actually the first man that God made, a choice that he made in which he disobeyed God. Now, God chose to put this man under a test to see whether or not he would obey, to see whether or not he loved the one who made him, the one who came down and had fellowship with him, the one who gave him a world, basically, to, to populate and to subdue uh, for the glory of God, to see if he loved him enough and trusted him enough. 
to obey what we might call an arbitrary command. You can do, basically, you can eat any, of any of the trees that I have made, you can eat of those freely. But there's one tree I don't want you to eat from. And really, I'm not sure that the first man, Adam, understood why, except that God said, you shall not eat from this tree. Now, the man loved God, and he wanted to obey Him. And he also knew the consequences if he ate from that tree. God told him, for in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. And he also knew that the choice that he made in the garden at that time would affect not only him, but it would affect all of his children. And by the way, we are his children. But in spite of this, he chose not to obey God, and the result was death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And of course, because he was the father of the whole human race, because he represented us in that decision, God made him our representative, and he was a perfect one. We all are cursed to die. Paul, writing to the Romans, writes in chapter 5, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, so death spread to all men, because all sinned. Through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. Now, that is why, after age 30, um, our cells don't replicate the way they used to. That's also why, by the way, you might actually not even make it to age 30. Perhaps somebody will kill you. Perhaps you'll take some kind of an overdose and die. Perhaps, you know, you'll get sick and die. We don't, we're not even guaranteed 30 years of life, but if you happen to make it to 30, that's why you go over the, the top and begin the downward slide. Now, scientists understand how the process happens, but only God can tell us why it happens. By the way, the first man is not the only one who sins. We have to make sure we understand that. We, as his children, have sinned every day of our lives, from the time we were born up until the present, which means that we deserve that condemnation. Now, the fact that you must die is, is really bad enough in and of itself, but God tells us it's actually much worse than this. Because after you die, even though your soul is separated from your body, it's still very much alive. You still know who you are, and you can still experience pleasure or pain. The Bible says that after your soul leaves your body, there's only one of two places that it can go, either to heaven, where it experiences great pleasure and joy and happiness in a world that is basically pure love if you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, or to hell if you haven't trusted Him. And hell is much worse than you could ever possibly imagine. Now, if God is such a good and gracious God, why is there a hell? Why did He create it? Well, it's because God is not only infinite love, and the, what we're going to see in just a moment of what He did to resolve the sin problem, what he did to actually save sinners will demonstrate his tremendous love, not to mention all the good things he gives to us in this world. He is also a just and holy God, and he must, he, he has to punish sin. It has to be dealt with. He cannot overlook it, which is why, of course, he sent his son into the world as well. But the thing is, hell is the just penalty that we all really do deserve for disobeying a God who is infinitely holy, which means a God who is infinitely loving. He loves what is right and good so much when he sees somebody hating, it's something that must be dealt with. Well, hell is that just penalty. God is infinitely holy, and any offenses committed against him are infinite offenses. So we all die... And we all come into this world not only liable to death, but also in danger of hell because we have all sinned against God. But now let's get to the good news. That was the bad news, by the way. The good news is God did something to fix the problem. Now, He didn't have to do this. We have to understand that. He could have left us all alone. He could have left us to our sins. He could have left us to our judgment. He could have been just in doing so. 
we could all have died and suffered in hell, and he could justly have allowed that, but his love would not allow him to do so. He did something about it. He sent his son into the world to save all who would believe in him. Perhaps if you haven't seen anything else in the Bible or heard anything else, perhaps you've heard this one verse, which has probably been quoted more than, than any other in Scripture. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus is that son. The Bible tells us that Jesus came into the world. He is the eternal son of God who became a man, who became one with us, and took on himself the responsibility that we actually had to obey his Father's commandments. And he did that for everyone who would trust in him so that he could give them a perfect record of obedience. The Bible says that Jesus took on himself the guilt of all those sins that had been committed of those who would actually trust in him. And he suffered and died on the cross to pay for those sins and to die in the place of those who would die so that they could go free. And to show us that he was successful in this work the Father sent him to do to save those who would trust in him, the Father raised him up again on the third day. Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus overcame death. And so he is able also to save you from death. That's what God tells us in his word. So the first man brought us into the circumstance. We have sinned numerous times. The wages of sin is death, not just physical death, but eternal death and punishment in hell. But God sent His Son to obey. He sent His Son to die so that those who would trust in Him would not die but have everlasting life. Now, that's the problem and that's what the Lord did to rectify the problem. The last thing we want to consider is how can you receive what Jesus actually did because it's not automatic. What Jesus did is not automatically applied to everybody in the world but rather it is applied to those who will trust him, as I've already told you. We're told in Acts 16.31 where on one occasion there was a man who was afraid because uh, of something that happened in his jail. He was the Philippian jailer. And he happened to wake up at midnight and he noticed that all the cells were open and he realized that if any of his prisoners had escaped, his life was forfeit. He was a Roman. So he took a sword and he was going to kill himself. But... Paul, who was, as you know, the apostle who went around preaching the gospel, said, don't, don't hurt yourself, we're all still here. Well, when the man heard that and saw what had happened, he came trembling into the cell and he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said this, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. All you have to do is believe. Believe that what God says in His Word regarding His Son and what His Son did is true, what we've already just looked at, but also trust Him. It's one thing to know that there's somebody who can save you. It's quite another actually to trust that individual to do it. Now, God doesn't tell you, clean up your act, and when you're good enough, I will let you into heaven. Kind of like the woman I talked to one time years ago when I asked her, do you think you're going to get into heaven? And she says, yes. I said, well, how do you know? And she says, well, when I get to heaven and St. Peter opens the gate, there is, there is, by the way, St. Peter isn't at the gate, but when St. Peter opens the gate, I'm going to stick my foot in the door and I'm not going to let him close it against me. Okay, well, that's not going to work, you see, but what is going to work is if you trust Jesus because if you trust Jesus, God will let you in. You don't have to stick your foot in any kind of a supposed door. And by the way, your, door, your foot wouldn't be able to stop that door anyway, even if it did exist. You don't have to do anything. It's not something God tells you to do as far as a work you have to do. You don't have to buy your way into heaven. You don't have to earn it by your works, and you really couldn't do that anyway. But basically, he says, believe on my son. Trust him to save you, and you will be saved. But don't forget this too, that since Jesus is saving you from the consequences 
of your disobedience, you also need to be willing to stop disobeying, to stop uh, rebelling, to stop hating, and begin loving in the way the Lord calls you to love. We call that obedience. You know, that's not going to be a problem, though, if you really trust the Lord. Because if the Lord gives you the grace to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, He will at the same time open your eyes to show you just how bad sin really is and how good it is to obey because it is the loving way. You know, sometimes we look at the Ten Commandments and we see them as the the Ten Don'ts, you know. But when you really understand what it is the commandments are telling you to do, you wouldn't find them to be so um, offensive because what they're telling you to do is simply, as I've said before, love. All the commandments can be summed up by love. Is it a loving thing to murder your neighbor? No. Is it a loving thing to commit adultery with your neighbor's wife or husband? No. Is it a loving thing to, to, you know, covet or envy what other people have or steal what they have or lie about them? No, those aren't loving things, nor is it loving to the God who created us to love other things more than Him or to worship other gods or to use His name as a swear word. What the Lord is telling us to do in the commandments is simply to love Him, and He's worthy of our love, and He's telling us to love our neighbor. That's all He's really asking us to do, so it's a good thing, and if we see that as bad, It just shows you how evil sin really is that can make us look at something that is so good and think that it is so bad. Well, as I've said, love is what's behind the commandments. He wants us to love Him as we should with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Now, the Bible says that if you will trust Jesus and if you will turn from your sin, stop hating people, stop hating God, and begin loving Him and loving others, not only will He forgive all your guilt, any one sin of which could condemn you forever, He'll forgive all of those things so that you'll never be afraid of hell again. But He will also give you His own Son's perfect record of obedience so that you will be able to enter into heaven. You won't have to stick your foot in the door and you won't have to try to amass enough good works to try to outweigh any bad works because you can't do that. You can't do good works and you can never outweigh your bad ones, certainly. One bad work is enough to condemn you, but Jesus will forgive all that and He will give you a perfect record by which you can enter into heaven if you simply trust in Him. By the way, He will also give you His Holy Spirit to raise your body from the grave one day and reunite it with your soul so that you can enjoy the new world that God is going to create one day. Again, Paul writes in Romans 8, 11, but if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Now, in closing, I just want to remind you of one thing. Consider just how gracious God really is. I mean, you were His enemy. Every day, God was giving you good things, and you weren't thankful. You weren't thanking Him for those things. Uh, Every day, you were offending Him in various ways because you weren't loving Him, because you weren't loving your neighbors yourself. Every day, you were rebelling against Him But in spite of this, he was willing to give what was most precious to him, his only begotten son, to obey and to die, and that in in the most humbling way possible, by becoming a curse on the cross and enduring God's full wrath against sin by dying and being under the power of death for three days. The prince of life experienced death so that you could live. But again, he didn't do all of this and then say, all right, give me all the money you have, give me everything you possess, go somewhere and die for me and I'll let you into heaven. That's not what God says. All you have to do is be willing to turn from your sins and trust in his son 
and He will give you eternal life. That is infinite mercy. That is infinite love. And you will never receive a better offer than this. If you want to live, that's what you must do. You must turn from your sins, trust in Jesus. He's the only one who has overcome death. He's the only one that God has given for that purpose. You have to trust in Him. He's the only one who can overcome it for you. So don't leave here thinking there are other ways. Don't leave here thinking that you're good enough. Uh, don't leave here thinking that your good works are going to outweigh your bad works because none of those things are true. There is only one way to heaven. Jesus says He is the door. You have to go through Him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. They said to the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. If you do anything other than that, you will not be saved. You will die and you will experience those things God says are true for those who will not turn from their sins and trust in Him. So receive God's mercy and grace. He offers it to you freely. It's a free gift. He says, reach out and take it. Trust in Him and He will do it for you. Believe on Him and you will be saved. Well, let's bow in just a moment of prayer and let's ask that the Lord would, would apply His Word uh, to us uh, as we need to hear it this morning.